One Man's Family, winner of 47 national awards, a Carlton E. Morse creation. One Man's Family, now in its 27th year, is dedicated to the mothers and fathers of the younger generation and to their bewildering offspring. Chapter 7, Book 133 of the Barber Family Saga. Today, Consider Martin leads us on. Tonight at 8.45 in a hotel ballroom in Burlingame, Mr. Jack Barber, attorney, exemplary husband, father of six beautiful daughters, arose at the speaker's table and delivered his celebrated after-dinner speech entitled The Separate Worlds of Parents and Children, for which through his lecture agent, Miss Bindi Blassingame, he'll receive a check which will help to pay the January 15th installment on his 1958 income tax. Thus, by working both day and night, he manages to stay even. A thought which bedevils him during the ride back to Seacliff. I hope. He's not in the best of spirits when at long last he arrives home. His wife, Betty, has fallen asleep in her chair. Betty, come on, let's go to bed. Mm -hmm. Come on, I'm home. Let's go to bed. Oh, my goodness. Was I asleep? Yeah, let's go up. I'm tired. Wait, 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 wait. Uh... Something I have to tell you. Uh, tell me when we get upstairs. Jack, now let me wake up now. Let me think. Uh, oh, yes, emergency. You're to call Pinky at the hotel right away. The minute you get home, the number's on the pad. Oh, no, I don't. Well, he said he wasn't calling as a nephew. He expects to pay the regular hourly rate. He needs you, Jack. He's phoned about eight times. Needs me for what? I don't know, but if he's willing to pay, it must be serious. Oh, you had some other calls, too. I bet I did. Ross Farnsworth sounded absolutely hysterical, but I said you were making a speech and couldn't possibly talk to him until tomorrow. Good for you. <sighs> they have a switchboard at Sears Savoy of Sausalito? Yes, of course they do. Pinky runs it after midnight. What time is it? Well, after one o'clock, so Pinky is running it. Now, let it ring. Did you say hysterical? Hmm? Ross? Oh, Joan blew up today and told Ross he had to live up to the letter of the custody agreement and only take the kids on weekends, so he just got furious. Good evening. Sir Savoy of Sausalito. May I help you, please? What's on your mind, Pinky? Hey, Uncle Jack, are you home? Yeah, I'm tired. I'm on my way to bed. Hey, wait, this is business. This is client to attorney. Didn't Aunt Betty tell you? I'll pay the regular... Uh Uh-oh. Hmm? I can't talk right now. Call you back. What happened? Uh Huh? Said he can't talk right now. He'll call me back. Oh, you do look tired. I'm sorry. The girls made hot chocolate. Would you like a cup? Still hot? Well, there's some out here in the thermos. Bring the phone. Uh, 120. Hey, guys, I gotta get some sleep. I got a date in the office at 8.30. Well, come on, out in the kitchen. The phone. Hi, right, guys. Well, let's shut the door. Oh, brother. I was thinking coming home. The fee for this speech, plus last month's disbursements, will pay my January 15th installment. So by working day and night, I'm going to be even. Mm -hmm. Aren't we lucky? Lots of people are behind. There, you see if that's hot enough. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's this? Oh, Hazel brought that over. That's a brochure about Pinky's Hotel. Inside it says, William M. H. Murray, night manager. Open it. See there? That's Pinky. Isn't that impressive, Jack? Night manager. Mm. Hazel's so proud. After all these years being worried about Pinky, to finally have him working and earning money with his name on a brochure. She got extra copies for everybody in the family. Yeah. Of course, he got the job in kind of a peculiar way, but if he's making good at it, that's all that really matters. Don't let your chocolate get cold. Mm. Would you like a slice of homemade bread? Mother Barbara made some today, and there's applesauce if you care, but you can get it quick. Yes? Uncle Jack, I couldn't talk before. Mr. Sears was here in the lobby. Look, it's a shame to bother you so late at night, but I've got a problem here. Uncle Paul went out of town this morning, so there's nobody but you. What is it, Pinky? Cousin Consider is out here at the hotel. Oh. He isn't doing my job any good. Where is he? Right now he's in the zebra room, leading community singing. Uh-huh. Uncle Jack? I'm here. Mr. Sears told me to send CZ home, but he won't go. And the only thing left for me to do is call the cops. I can't do that to CZ. Okay, Pinky, I'll get the car and come over the bridge. Charge me your regular hourly attorney's fee. Don't think I won't. We'll return.
return in just a moment to one man's family. Do you know who said, Every individual in society has certain powers, rights, and privileges which no other individual can justly abridge or destroy. Those words were written by Noah Webster, the man who compiled America's first great dictionary. Mr. Webster knew that if the country which he had seen come into being were to succeed, the rights of the individual have to be protected. Each person is entitled to certain basic rights, powers, and privileges which must not be taken away because of the whim of someone with greater power. In the United States, the individual is important regardless of his wealth, power, or position. The importance of the individual is closely linked to the American tradition. Remember the words of Noah Webster. They are part of your American heritage. The rights and privileges of the individual must be preserved. In the mirrored lobby of Sears Savoy of Sausalito, Pinky Murray, the long, unemployed grandson of Mr. Henry Barber, is sitting at the switchboard in dinner jacket. Sears Savoy of Sausalito. Yes, ma'am. He's in room 1212. One moment, please. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, Pinky, my boy, the Native American has forgotten how to sing. Uh, just a moment, Cece. Uh, no, sir. Mr. Sears is going to his apartment. Who's calling, please? Oh, yes, Mr. Emery. Is this Mr. Leslie Emery? Yes, sir. He said to put your call right through. You're welcome, Mr. Emery. Thank you, Mr. Emery. Oh, that's dreadful, dreadful. What's dreadful? Oh, never mind. Pinky, my lady buck, I had a talk with your employer in the zebra room this evening. CZ, please. He doesn't seem to relish community singing. Quieter, CZ. Keep it down. I said to him, Mr. Sears, said I, do you realize that gaiety and humor have well nigh departed from the American scene? Keep it down, will you, please, CZ? Mr. Sears has been complaining. Uh, Mr. Sears is a man utterly devoid of humor. Maybe so, but he's my boss. Devoid of humor, unresponsive to music, utterly lacking in the spirit of the dance. Look, CZ, if you don't mind... I tried to describe to him the saddest sight I encountered in all 1958. A high school dance which I chaperoned for Sharon. Have you lately watched a high school dance, Pinky Maletti Buck? Oh, no. No gaiety, no sparkle, no laughter. Solemn, grim young faces counting their shuffling steps or leaping about with a frightening earnestness. What, pray tell, has happened to laughter? Where's it gone? In our grim quest to the wonders of the 20th century... Have we erased all joy of living? Hey, please. My heart bleeds when I glance into the faces that go skimming by in speeding cars on the freeways. Eyes fixed, shoulders hunched, lips compressed. Uh, oh, tell me, me, Pinky. Are these living uh, men me. or commuting zombies? Pardon me. What? Oh, 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 oh. Yes, Mr. Sears? Uh, huh. Is shouting? Where? Well, I'll look into it right away, Mr. Sears. Yes, sir, Mr. Sears. Yes, sir, Mr. Sears. I will, Mr. Sears. Oh, Pinky, Pinky, the servile tone. Yes, sir, Mr. Sears. Free spirit now embracing nepotism. What's nepotism? Well, once there was a bishop, Bishop Nepo, who supported his kinfolk on the estate of the church, hence the word. And so it is with you. You are dependent on the favors of the humorless father of Sander Seven. Listen to me, Lady Buck. In all love and friendship, I must say this to you. Nothing is so false as an innkeeper's cordiality. No greeting so machine-made as an innkeeper's welcome. No charm so shallow, no love so brief. Hot friendships cool under the cashier's stamp. Paid, and it's over. Oh, I, I can't bear to watch this. Can't come here anymore. If you wish to see me, Lady Buck, visit me at Jones. Call me a cab, please. I'll be waiting in the cool night air. the barbers in just a moment. There are hundreds of children in Germany, as well as hundreds more in the United States, who believe that Sergeant Charles E. Davis was a year-round Santa Claus. The children's belief is well-founded, for Davis, a Tennessee-born orphan, became a sort of guardian angel for orphans when he spearheaded the organizing of the Hands Across the Ocean Committee, 
which provided assistance for the orphanages in West Germany. It all began when Davis, a military police veteran of over 30 years' service, was stationed near Pottsville, Pennsylvania in 1952. He discovered a down-at-the-heels orphanage housing over a hundred children. A quick investigation convinced him that the institution needed help badly, and he decided to do something about it. So he hustled back to his MP company, enlisted the support of other soldiers, and began a building fund which was used to buy blankets, food, and toys for the children. Soon after helping put the Pennsylvania orphanage on its feet, Sergeant Davis was transferred to Germany. There he found children in even worse conditions than back home. Many of them still lived in the streets, dirty and destitute, because of overcrowded conditions in orphanages. The sergeant went right to work and organized a group of MPs to assist in improving conditions at the orphanages in towns near his base. They began by rounding up dozens of cots, boxes of clothes and blankets, and hundreds of colorful toys. Then Davis sent out appeals for help from many other sources. Soon, so many gifts were pouring in that the Hands Across the Ocean Committee had to be formed to help Sergeant Davis and his assistants with their distribution. No wonder hundreds of unfortunate orphans still think of Sergeant Charles E. Davis as a year-round Santa Claus. As a result of his unselfish work, the sergeant has given us all a thought to remember. We are Americans. As we go, so goes America. Betty, rousing in the cold darkness of the master bedroom, blinked sleepily toward a white-clad figure making its way from bathroom to bed. Jack, is that you? Yeah, here I am. It's freezing. Oh, are you just getting home? Goodness, what time is it? 3 a.m., the darkest hour before the dawn. Oh, Jack, how awful. Did you bring Cousin Consider back with you? Cousin Consider drove away in a taxi just as I arrived in Sausalito. Oh, oh, no. Wild goose chase. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you see Pinky? I did. You'll have to hire another lawyer. I've had it. I'm through. Did you tell him that? In simple sentences, even he could understand. Oh, there'll be all kinds of repercussions. You'll be sorry. <gasps> oh, Jack! Your feet are cold. Oh, they're like flint. So is my heart. I'm no softy. Brother, I did it. I got rid of a major problem with no regret. Good night, Betty. I'll bet you wake up sorry. One Man's Family, which comes to you Monday through Friday, is written by Harlan Ware and directed by Carlton E. Morse. This program has been selected to be heard by our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. In Chapter 8, Book 133, A Long Day of Insomnia. Frank Barton speaking. One Man's Family, winner of 47 national awards, now in its 27th year, is a Carlton E. Morse production and comes to you from California. One Man's Family has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.